Zealand. Title of the message today, God's plan for the world. Now there are some who would accuse us of not believing that God has a plan for the world. Indeed, Calvinists and folks who believe in the sovereignty of God are often accused of being anti-missions and anti-evangelism. Regardless of the very fact that the greatest evangelists in history have all held to, to particular, particular limited, limited and definite atonement. Perhaps the greatest sermon ever preached that rendered the greatest response on this continent and in this country was preached by a strong Calvinist. That sermon was titled, titled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Preached by Jonathan, Jonathan Edwards. Edwards. And it's and told, told that the people could, the people could literally, well, maybe not literally, could almost imagine themselves hanging on to a cliff, dangling, dangling above, above the flames of hell, of hell as he preached, he preached that message. message. You and me saw also in this letter how chapter 8, verses 31 through 39 presented you with Christian assurance. Isn't assurance great? Isn't it good to know that you know that you know that you know that you are saved? John said in his letter, for I've written these things unto you that you may know that you have salvation. Not wish that you have salvation, but know that you have salvation. Indeed, Calvinists are the only ones who can have assurance. For do not believe in particular and definite atonement is the theological version of holding a daisy in your hand and picking off one petal at a time and saying, God loves me, God loves me not. God loves me, God loves me not. And getting to that very last daisy and oh no, we're at, we're at God loves me, loves me not. That is the reality for those who, who, who object, object to, to reformed, reformed and Calvinistic, Calvinistic theology. theology. Now Paul concludes here in chapter 11, verses 33 to 36, his survey of salvation history. And he places you in awe of God's extraordinary plan for the world. Now for us to say that God has an extraordinary plan for the world is not contradictory to Reformed theology. And in fact, To preach, to preach limited atonement, atonement is, not is not contradictory to Arminian theology. Because even faithful Arminians believe that the atonement is limited. They just define, they define limited, limited differently. differently. But faithful Arminians don't believe that everybody is going to be saved. They believe, rather, that the, the, the atonement is limited to only those who choose Jesus. But God has an extraordinary plan for the people.
people of the world. God is calling, calling, and He has has been calling, and He will continue to call until Jesus returns men from all nations. Though not all nations will be totally converted, there will be men from all nations who surrender to Him as Lord. This short section contains three exclamations, three rhetorical questions, and a reminder that God is sovereign, and that He alone is deserving of praise, for He is gracious. God is sovereign, and He is gracious, and He is worthy to be praised. We have three points. Our points today are riches, wisdom, and knowledge, and affirmation of faith as authority over creation, and finally, of Him, and through Him, and to Him. him. Let's begin by reading chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. As we go to the Lord in prayer, consider those depths. Consider His riches his wisdom, wisdom, his knowledge, and how deep these are. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you that you are both transcendent and you are imminent. In your holiness, holiness, you are are transcendent transcendent from your creatures. For we are depraved and sinful. But in your eminence, you came, came, took upon yourself flesh, And lived as a man. Experiencing life as a man. So that you could die die as a man. man. That we as men may live unto you. Lord, may we never... Take what you did in the Incarnation and in your death and in your resurrection lightly. May we never make the mistake mistake of either overemphasizing your deity Or overemphasizing your humanity. We will likely never understand how those two natures could come together. But you are God, and you accomplished it. And you did it. You did it. For your creation. To call man back. (laughs) 
to that pre be or back to that Edenic state. Through your shed blood. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Verse 33 begins with a simple Oh, oh. And you may as well put an exclamation point after that. After that oh. For what is Paul saying, saying here in verse, verse 31? Oh! Oh! He's exclaiming that which everything he said prior culminates in, in now. Now. Oh, the depth. Christianity is not shallow. Christianity cannot be simplified into three easy, easy, or five easy, or ten easy steps. Christianity cannot be isolated to just how to have, have a successful, successful career or how to have a how to raise, raise good children. Christianity cannot be limited to just having a happy life. Indeed, Happiness. happiness, your happiness is never guaranteed in Scripture. We as Americans too often confuse happy with joy. And the two are not the same. the same. Happy is external. external. Joy is internal. Happiness is determined by that which happens is determined by that which is in you. As a Christian, you can be joyful even in the midst of suffering. But the unconverted can only experience or long for happiness. The unconverted can only look for those cheap, temporary thrills. The unconverted look for those moments, those events, those circumstances that create Happiness. Because they are void in their hearts and in their souls of that which can bring them joy. Translations like the NIV <laughs> render verse 33 In such a way that riches is seen as governing wisdom and knowledge. But when you examine the Greek, Pluto, 
which is riches. You see a different idea. It's not an idea of, of riches governing wisdom and knowledge. So what the NIV would say that riches stands here above wisdom and knowledge. But the Greek actually shows riches Wisdom, wisdom, knowledge, side by side. Riches stands as that third attribute. Why do you think that would be? Look at how often in the New Testament, particularly. Couples, word, groups of words in threes. Perhaps the most popular is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Those three words, faith, hope, and love, are also found in 1 Thessalonians. Both at the beginning of 1 Thessalonians and and at the end of 1 Thessalonians. And what's inter interesting in Thessalonians is that Paul actually reverses the order a bit. So that instead of in Corinthians, where he says faith, hope, and love, in Thessalonians he says faith, love, hope. Why is that? Could it be that when he's writing to the Corinthians, he needs to emphasize love, and call the Corinthians to love one another, while in Thessalonians, he needs to emphasize hope and show them the hope they have in Christ Jesus. Here we see three words. Riches, wisdom, and knowledge. Three great attributes of our king. And it's not incidental. Because what do we believe about God? He is three in one. He is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Not three different gods. One God. Hero of Israel. The Lord our God is one he is one God in three persons. And they're all kind of analogies that folks have utilized over the years to try to explain the Trinity. Unfortunately, if you press those analogies too far, you actually work your way into heresy. Whether you use the analogy of, of a man being a father to his son, a son to his father, and whatever else, and, and, a, and a husband to his wife, or whether you use the analogy of electricity and, and the light switch and the light bulb, if you press those illustrations too far, you work yourself out of orthodoxy and into heresy. Because that, because all of those illustrations eventually break down to modalism. In which God is seen at different times in different places operating as one of those three. But... The scriptures don't show God working only as Father, or only as Son, or only as Spirit. The three are unity. 
Think of that word Trinity. The interesting thing about the word Trinity is you, you can easily say try unity. Try unity. The Father does not work apart from the Son and the Holy Ghost. The Son does not work apart from the Father and the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost does not work apart from, from the Father and the Son. The, Son. the three are one. Knowledge refers to God's relational, indeed his covenantal knowing, which he expresses in election. In election, God shows that he's relational. In calling you into covenant with himself. He is not... Arbitrary. He doesn't just, just randomly, randomly line by himself, himself and, and stand there, stand there with, with darts, darts, throwing them in a dartboard, and, and oh wow, this one landed and hit Eric. No, God is intentional and relational in his covenantal election and love. We get to that word judgment. Some distinguish, distinguish judgments. Oh, the depth of the riches, both the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments. Some would distinguish from God's judicial decisions. away from his executive decisions. And I would argue that that's probably a, a, a purely American thing, because in America we have what? We have three co-equal branches of government. In which, in which, according to the Constitution, Constitution not always, not always played, played out this way, but according, according to the Constitution, Constitution the judicial branch is not the legislative branch, the legislative branch is not the executive branch. But God doesn't operate in American terms. God doesn't operate in a democracy. God operates in a theocracy. And so we cannot biblically separate his judicial decisions from his executive decisions. To do that then puts us back here. God is executive and he is, he is judge. judge. Turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Psalm 19 and verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day and the day under speech, and night and the night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. And then hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, 
and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. His testimony the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, right. rejoice in your heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. In this life, from time to time, time, we find ourselves standing before a human judge. Indeed, we've seen various high-profile cases televised for months on end. And sometimes the results for those high-profile cases spill out into the streets. And they spill out into the streets. The judge, because man is unclean, man is man does not endure, and man's judgments are not true and righteous. But when God makes a decree, He is true. He is righteous. He is not biased. And his decree, though we may not understand it in the moment, his decree is for your good. That's why Paul could say back in chapter 8, For we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Turn over to Psalm 36. Psalm 36, verse 1. The transgression of the wicked saith within, within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth... Or iniquity and deceit he hath left off to be wise and to do good. He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reaches, reacheth unto the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. O Lord, Thou preservest man and beast. God says what? Righteousness is like great mountains. Judgments are like a great deep. So picture the highest mountain and the deepest valley. His righteousness is higher than that highest mountain peak. And his judgments are more grounded than the deepest deep. And in Psalm 119, and we will not read that in its entirety today. Not opposed to reading it in its entirety in one setting, but we will not do that today. Psalms 119, verse 73. Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. They that fear thee will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. When God acts as executive and judge, when God afflicts you, He afflicts you in His 
faithfulness. Because what does that mean? But that you are a son. Discipline does not seem right in the moment. But it is for your good. Indeed, if you are not disciplined, if you can continue in sin without being judged, if you can continue in sin without, without being chastised, that's a pretty good sign that you're not saved. If you can enjoy your sin without any thought otherwise, then you are not saved. So be careful. Next we'll look at the affirmation of faith in verse 34 and 35. And in this affirmation of faith, we see that God has authority over creation. God has authority over creation. Why? Because He is... Creator. Romans 11, verse 34 and 35. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Of the Lord? Who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him? It's not as here in verse 34, a little bit of reverse chiasm. Chiasm is simply the way of You say A, then you say B, then you say C, and then you'll say repeat C, then you'll repeat B, and then you come back so that you begin and you end on the same note. The same note. And so there is a bit of reverse chiasm here. Here. Whereas in whereas in verse and knowledge, now he's going to reverse it and and speak of knowledge and wisdom. And riches. Paul asks, Who hath known the mind of the Lord? That indeed is knowledge. Who has known the mind of the Lord? He asks, Who has been his counsel. That's wisdom. Sometimes folks get wisdom and knowledge confused. But they are not the same. The same. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put tomato in your fruit salad. Knowledge and wisdom are not the same. Knowledge is knowing the Lord. Wisdom is walking with the Lord. I believe that, that everyone, everyone on the planet, on the planet if you were if to you press them hard, hard enough, enough, would have to admit that they know that there is a God. There may be some rare exceptions of folks who are true atheists. Atheism are really agnostic. The difference is an atheist states that there is no God, while God. Well, the agnostic simply says, I don't, know. I don't know. But if you press 
either of these hard enough, they're going to have to admit that there's something beyond what they know. The only way that somebody, that somebody could, tr could, tr could, could claim atheism honestly, honestly is that that, that that person knew everything about every single subject. And then guess what? Atheism would then be proven false because if there's anybody that knows everything about every single subject, what does that make that person? God. And so, if that person knows everything about every single subject, then that, then that person has to be God, and if that person has to be God, then atheism has just been debunked. These questions, who has known the mind of the Lord, are taken straight out of the Old Testament. Indeed, Eric read of those when he read from, read from Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 13. Knowledge and wisdom understand and interpret the mind of God. Star, star. Wisdom and knowledge understand and interpret the mind of God. And who can do that? Something else about this very section of Scripture. Of scripture. These verses says. Present you and me with high Christology. For in asking who has known the mind of the Lord, who has been his counselor, understanding that knowledge and wisdom understand and interpret the mind of God, who is the only one who can do that? The one who embodies wisdom. That is Christ. Christ, Christ, Christ is the one, the one who knows, who knows the, mind the mind of the Lord. Christ is, Christ the, one is the one who is, who is the, counselor. the counselor. Christ is the one who understands and interprets the mind of God. And it is Christ who embodies wisdom. And then we come finally to riches. Turn with me to Job 41. Job 41, verses 1 to 11. Job 41, verses 1 to 11. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook, with an hook? Or his tongue with a tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook into his nose or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he For a servant forever? Wilt thou play with him as with a bird? Or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? Shall the companions among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed arms? Or his head with fish spears? Lay thine hand upon him. Remember the battle. Do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. 
Who then is able to stand before me? Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. And let's look back at verse 3. Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? God's riches come from his own love. Great way to remember grace is to say God's riches at, at Christ, Christ expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches come from His own love. love. And when we think about think high Christology, what was the greatest act of love? Act of love. Christ's substitutionary atonement. The fact that he who knew no sin, no sin became, became sin, sin for you. you. The one who the was tested in all in points, all points and yet was without, without sin, 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 had your, your sin, sin and mine poured, poured upon, upon him. him. He, he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So that you would never be forsaken. Then finally, verse 36. And in verse 36, we see another trilogy. trilogy. Just as we saw in verse 33, riches, wisdom, and knowledge. Repeated again in verse 34 and 35. Knowledge, wisdom, and riches. We see another trilogy in verse 36. For of him, and through him, and to him, are all things, to whom to be whom glory be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Of him, of him, and through him, through him, and to him. He is the source of... He is the sustainer. He is the goal. There is no other source. There is no other sustainer. There is no other goal. Indeed, indeed, as Jesus, as Jesus said, in said in John chapter 14, I am the way, the, way, the, truth, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He is the goal. And He is the source in getting you to that goal. And He is the sustainer in giving you the strength to persevere to the end. As we wrap up this section, I can't help but come back to the very first question of the Westminster Catechism. What is the chief end of man? Of man. And knowledge. When we think about, about of him, him, and through him, and, through him, and to him. him. Meet man. man. How does it? How does it meet you? you. What is your chief end? Your chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. 
unless you're saved, unless you've recognized the reality and the depth of your own sin. Unless you Unless recognize you us where sin leads, sin leads. You, cannot you cannot enjoy, enjoy him. 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 And you cannot glorify Him. You begin glorifying Him and you begin enjoying Him in salvation. You begin enjoying and glorifying Him by surrendering to Him as Lord. Last week in Sunday school, we talked about Thomas, 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 Thomas Judas. Judas. And how and all the disciples, the disciples never, never once, once in the New Testament, never once in the Gospels, is, is Thomas, Thomas ever recorded as referring, as referring to Jesus, Jesus as Lord. Why is that? We see the answer in John's first letter. No one can say that Jesus is the Christ apart from the Spirit. Thomas could not, could not claim, claim that Jesus was Lord. Could not say that Jesus was Lord because the Spirit was not in him. Have you surrendered to Jesus, Jesus as Lord? Is Lord. Have, you have you come, to, come him to Him in confession and repentance, saying the same thing about your sin that God says about, God it. Says about it, and running, and running from, that, from sin. that sin? Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we bow before you. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That you call us out of darkness into light. Out of misery into your glory. Out of apathy. apathy. And into your love. From death. To life. Lord, we pray that the wonder, the depth of your riches and wisdom and knowledge would permeate would saturate, saturate our very hearts, our very hearts and our lives. lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. pray. Amen. Amen.